Hey there, UK fans. One more reminder. Brendan and I are currently doing the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Book your tickets today. Come see a fun show. I'm also doing a live Art of Wrestling podcast Sunday the 7th and Sunday the 14th and a double bill with ICW's Billy Kirkwood. Tickets and information for everything is at ColtCabana.com. Come enjoy some live comedy, but for now, enjoy the show. This is the Art of Wrestling with professional wrestler Colt Cabana. All right, how you guys doing? Come on in, sit down, relax. You're about to listen to The Art of Wrestling, a professional wrestling podcast. It's a live podcast. It's a personal journal. It's an entry way into the minds and souls, the hearts, and the lives of the people involved in the world of professional wrestling. I am your host. My name is Colt Cabana. I'm a fringe goer. I'm a performer. I'm a quasi-comedian. Most importantly, though, I am a professional wrestler, and I am not sitting here live in my studio apartment in Chicago, Illinois. I am in a dormitory of some sorts in Edinburgh, Scotland. I'll tell you all about it. Before we go any further, those are fan support and listener support of podcast support by people just like you. Give it to you free of charge every single Thursday on ColtCabana.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, Howl, wherever you get your podcasts from. A couple great ways that you can support. Rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. Tell a friend. Let somebody know. Tweet it out. Facebook it out. The best way to support, though, ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com, t-shirts, buttons, pictures, posters, DVDs, digital downloads. I just put up a new compilation digital download on Digital Colt there. A lot of people have been asking for some matches, and so I put some on there. Go support ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com. Oh, that's right. The Funkster is on the show. I could do this all day, by the way. Do you think he's here? Hey, Terry. Hey, Colt. Good to see you. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop that. That's almost that was was that almost embarrassing. That's not that's not how the comedy shows go, guys. I'm better than that. I got better chops than sitting here doing Terry Funk impressions. But Terry Funk is on the show, and uh, there's a lot of guys. You know, last week Sabu was on, and I said, you know, he's like this icon of the independent wrestling world and what the independent wrestler stands for. And now I'm sitting here with Terry Funk, who is I, also, I could sit there and say, like, he represents what an independent wrestler is all about. And yeah, he had these glory runs in WWF and WCW and NWA, but he's like the king of the small time show. He's just, uh, that's like who he's been all about. He's never been about the man. He's always been about damn the man and what's good for the boys and what's good for wrestling in general. And so uh, a true outlaw on the show and such a pleasure to have pushing uh, pushing a something years old. So, you know, we sit there and we chat. I uh, I know. You don't even have to tell me. I know that, like, I try to forward the conversation, and then I'm kind of, and then I'm kind of, like, talking over them a little bit, and I stop myself real early in it. So don't remind me. I know my own faults, and I tell you right away. Like, you'll probably now realize it and be like, oh, I wouldn't even noticed, but that's the kind of guy I am. I'm just letting you know all about how shitty I am at podcasting. But uh, not that shitty, because I got the fucking funkster on the show. Such a pleasure. And um, just um, like a dream guest, a guy that I've always wanted to have on the show, I've always wanted to talk to, I've always wanted to just show... I guess my audience, like what a conversation between myself and Terry Funk would be. And now uh, I get to share with you. And I'm very proud of that and very happy about it. I am at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival right now. I'm doing this in Edinburgh. I'm currently sitting at a desk in a dormitory room with my bedspread over my head. I'm so hot in here. I might pass out while podcasting. If you don't hear about any reviews from my shows, it's because I died of exhaustion while podcasting. But I'm doing it. Brendan Burns is in one room. Australian comedian Craig Quartermain is in another. An American comedian Chris Gethard is in uh, is in the fourth room. That's the team this year. That's that's the digs this year. Not in a house though. We're in like student living, but we're right in the middle of it. So I'm super excited about that. It's an exciting time. Before I came here though, I was at the London Comic Con, and uh, if you want to know how unpopular you are. Go to a London Comic Con and sit next to Ted DiBiase and Hacksaw Jim Duggan, and then you'll find out exactly how unpopular you are. But, um, you know, those things, uh, that was part of the deal where I, I kind of needed to do that in order to kind of fund the uh, Edinburgh show. So I uh, stuck my humility in my pocket. I signed some pictures, and I did. I, I met a lot of great fans. You know, like, you you, you know how it is. Some fans remember Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Some fans remember Ted DiBiase. And then other fans, like, Dig the show and dig the podcast, and they come out to see me, and that's really touching when they do come up. And, you know, they let me know the show's affected them, and they dig it. And uh, it doesn't go unnoticed, and I appreciated everyone who came out of the Comic-Con and said that to me. Also, when you're doing these things, I'm sharing green rooms with Carl Weathers, 
Napoleon Dynamite, the British guy from Lost, the little girl from Stranger Things, which I binge watched, by the way, Stranger Things on Netflix, good lord. And then that's kind of weird, like fanboying over a little 11 year old girl. <laughs> oh, God, that really puts you in check. And like, it's not just me, it's probably a whole line of people getting her autograph and being like, oh, I love you. And she's just like, I'm just, I'm just an 11 year old girl. Doing a lot of weird impressions today. I'm getting in comedy mode. It's kind of, it's probably getting annoying. I apologize. Listen, going forward, we're going to do some live shows while I'm at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I've made that precedent the last couple of years. We're going to do two in Edinburgh. I got two live shows on the back end that I'm going to give to you guys. So uh, that way I, it's not as stressful for me. I could just perform. I could just get shit done. So this is kind of the last uh, talky talk one. The live shows are always hilarious and always so much fun. Don't skip out on those. Give them a chance. It's an hour in your day. Enjoy the live shows. And then uh, also enjoy this talk with the Funker. Gonna be great. Before we go to it, though, I do have a song of the week. And the song of the week is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a landing page, a beautiful gallery, a professional blog, a professional wrestling blog, or any kind of wrestling-related web page, it's all included with your Squarespace site. Let's talk about why Squarespace rules. First of all, it's easy. With a click of the mouse, you drag and drop. You can build a website. I promise you. You can do it. Free custom domain. Sign up for a year. They'll give you a domain free for a year. They got beautiful templates, a.k.a. gone are the days of putting up those GeoCities and Angel Fire pages with the dancing icons. These are very, very nice. They look professional. Seamless commerce tools, which basically means you get to sell stuff on your website, and that's how you make money, and that's how you support your habit or whatever you're doing. 24-7 customer support. They got your back. Literally millions of people use it, and some of your favorite sites are no doubt ran by Squarespace. You might as well go with what the pros use. Start your free trial today. Go to squarespace.com and enter the offer code Colt. Get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace.com, enter the code Colt. Squarespace, set your website apart. The song this week is by Terry himself. Well, it's by a couple of people. We talk a little bit about it in the talk. He had an album in Japan. He wasn't very happy about it. He didn't expect me to bring it up. I did. This song is bananas. It, Jimmy Hart shows up. A Japanese dude trying to speak English is on it. Terry's on it. It's Oh, it's wonderful. It's called The Great Texan. Enjoy it. We'll be back with Terry Funk. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the most dynamic person in the world. So people of the world have no real great Texan. Terry Funk is here. so sad people think I'm so mean my heart is soft and sweet but I'm still a fighting machine promotional consideration paid for by the following hey guys this week's podcast is also brought to you by Blue Apron for less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. That's right, you're the cook. But they're just going to set up everything for you like you know how to do it. Even you can be a real grown-up. Blue Apron knows the keys to great meals is great ingredients, so their standards is always artisanal suppliers, family-run farms, fisheries, and ranchers. Whether it's Japanese ramen or wild-caught Alaskan salmon, Blue Apron is bringing you the best. You can pick your preferences too. I hate seafood, so they don't send me seafood. That's how it works out. Give me the meat. I want the meat. Some of the meals in August are spiced pork burgers with goat cheese and cucumber and corn salad and chicken tinga tacos with summer squash and tomato salsa. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free 
Shipping for free also, blueapron.com slash Colt. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Again, that's B-L-U-E-A-P-R-O-N.com slash Colt. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Yes, sir. You know the deal. So um, I remember I was I was 20-something years old. And I took a DDT, and Tommy Dreamer was in the back. This was Ring of Honor. Yeah. And Tommy Dreamer, I won him over because My buddy. Cause I bumped. He goes, thanks for taking that bump for the Funkster. He was so, I won his heart because I made, I made you look good, I think. <laughs> that was, uh, that's how I won over Tommy Dreamer. And that was, I think, the first time that we met. That we, if, I, don't, if, I don't know if that's what you recall that we worked together. Did something else spark your mind? Well, is it, uh, I just... You know, I've heard your name and a lot, a lot of times, you know, and through the years. But it yeah. seems like our paths didn't cross right. up here. Well, I mean, I even know that we were up here. You know, yeah, they, they just didn't cross. And I think, I think we crossed one time. I'm trying to figure out where it was, but it was at an arena. That was that. But, uh, yeah. It was. Uh, we had a good crowd, and I, I watched you working. You remember, and, yeah. Uh, you did okay. Thank you. Know? you. I know it. You, I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not BSing. Or yeah. Anything. Well, I. But, uh, I think there. I always, always, and that's why I remembered you because yeah. I've seen, I've seen everybody there is to see, right. and I've well, seen some great ones and I've seen some bad ones. And that's what kind of I'm saying is like I, I'm this guy who's been on the independent scene forever, yeah. and you're this. You have been. And you're I this think, independent spirit. Yeah. I, I. You know that's the truth. I always wanted to be my own boss. Yeah. You know, and that's very difficult to do. And I always ran, wanted to write my own song, and I always wanted to work my own match. Where do you Where do you get that from? Where do you think? My pop. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, I, I get it from uh, running a territory for twenty five years before uh, WWE uh, became national and uh, took away all of the regional territories. You'd say you had, you had and your hands. And I knew that. I knew it was going to happen, and uh, it didn't need somebody telling me. It, I knew it was going to happen because that's just the way the business evolved. You saw it coming? Yes, sir. And were you hoping that it wouldn't happen? or? Um, I guess you went with the punches, huh? Well, as you know, as um, I... I rolled with the punches. I knew it was going to happen. It had to happen because of all of the television stations across the country, you know, and uh, the regional stations. And then there was uh, two places that it could have came from. It could have come from, you know, the national territory. It could have came from L.A. or New York because they had the ability of television, you know. You guys didn't the ability think to put it, uh, the ability to go across the country on the networks, and we did not. Nobody else did in the country, and they did. And uh, but that's the way the business evolved. Do I feel bad about it? Of course not. You didn't it's just think the it, way it happened. You didn't think in Texas you guys would have the ability to to take over the world? Uh no, no. because you can't. You couldn't take over the world. You couldn't take over the world because you had to be in a media center. Mm. Because they had the networks at the time, and the networks were what was so important for so many years. And those networks crossed the country, and that's how, you know, as, uh, I don't know if you remember, you, you know, there's Walmart that uh, just wiped out every little market and store in the country, you know, and, uh, and you know, there's Joe's... Uh, you know, grocery store downtown in your little city, and along came Walmart and put a big store in, and Joe disappeared. You know, and that's the way it was. It was Vincent the same K. Thing. Walmart. Vincent K. <laughs> Is that what we, right? That's what it was. Vincent K. Walmart came in. Yeah, and he wiped everybody out. You know, but uh, it was going to happen, mm -hmm. and it happened where they New York was the one that uh, had the opportunity and took advantage of it. Uh, and you like I remember you went there. Yes, you went there eighty yes. four ish or something yes. like that. And, and I'd also like to say that uh, every time I see Vince is, uh, you know, whenever I went up there, is I went up there one time, you know, and uh, it was just New York 
after that, you know, and it was New York, and I thought, damn, I don't want to be up here in this big city up here, you know, there's too damn many people. And I went from uh, the airport to Vince's office, and it took about uh, three hours, you know. It wasn't Vince's office, it was the, uh, he asked me to come to his office, and I went in the, the morning, be- the the night before, you know. Mm. And I got a hotel, but it took me a long time to get there. So I got up at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning and uh, turned around and uh, caught an airplane out. <laughs> you know, but I went ahead and left a message at the hotel desk that said, my horse is sick, I think he's dying, you know. Just and, the humble uh, and bumble of the big city? Yeah. Because you're a Texas boy. Yeah. My horse is sick, I think he's dying. And I was, uh, I went back home, you know, and uh, that was the end of that. But then later on, as uh, I came up here for something and saw Vince, and he said, "How's your horse?" <laughs> no, he'll never forget it. Huh? No. Either did you? You're, you still no, have that story. No, I'll never forget it. Yeah, yeah. I'll never forget it. Yeah. Did you? Did you feel like like that first time you went in? And you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you know you did that program with Junkyard Dog and stuff. Well, you know that was a that was a great program and stuff. It was just that. Uh, uh, never had the opportunity to go to another level. But did you feel that like a little bit of your heart was a little like sunk because you had, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm wrestling for this mainstream guy now as opposed to the mom and pop wrestling. Um, does that make sense? Well, you know, as I, I really in, enjoyed it up here whenever I was made that run up here, that mm-hmm. was, you know, um, uh, it was, it was a good run that I made whenever I made it up here. And uh, I just, it's not a, it's a situation where, you know, as I'm, I'm from a very different type of upbringing. Okay. And I'm talking about uh, in Amarillo, Texas, you know, and you look out there and there's wide open spaces, you know, and there's a lot of wonderful things about it and a lot of wonderful things up here. If you know what to look for, mm-hmm. you know I mean uh, people and and uh, family and 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 many different things. You know uh, the beauty of four seasons. You know is uh, we certainly have that though down in Texas. You know all of them very established too. But uh, well, what was your upbringing? My upbringing was. Uh, just out on a ranch. Was it right in? Was it right into wrestling? Do you remember wrestling at the, it was, at the very it young was age? On a ranch. My upbringing was I went to uh, I went to uh, school, uh, lived on the ranch, uh, worked on the ranch, raised cattle on the ranch. Uh, got into high school, uh, started playing junior high football, went through high school, you know, and then I went on into college and played all the way through college. And uh, was football your first love? Of course not. No. Never. Never. My first love was wrestling. I started wrestling when I was four years That's old. That's what I was going to say. Amateur. Okay. And uh, wrestled all the way through high school. And But then whenever it became, uh, I got to college, is it, it uh, I had an opportunity to go to a fine school with a couple of All-Americans a senior year, you know, as Pete Pedro and... Uh, uh, Dwayne Thomas and uh, some great, great athletes were there. Uh, is it, as far as you there. remember, was your father, always, was he promoting wrestling? Like, is, are your uh, first... Yes, he promoted wrestling. Was that your first memories, though? Like, do you remember him not promoting wrestling? Oh, I can remember whenever I was uh, five years old, four years old, you know, and uh, go to a restaurant and... Somebody would pop off about the business and say that business is, hey, you know, is wrestling phony. And uh, my old man would get up in the middle of the restaurant and beat the crap out of him, you know. And uh, honestly, as I saw that happen many, many times, and um, people tremendously respected him and respected the business. Were you, like, scared or proud when he did that? Do you remember oh, your feelings? Oh, definitely. I never, I never saw him get beat in my life. 
So like when he gets and up, he was a very tough individual. He was uh, if there was the shoot fighters were within our business at that time. Uh -huh. My father was definitely a great shooter. Um, he went to Indiana University. The only reason that he didn't do a lot more than what he did is because of World War II breaking out. And uh, there was uh, a lot of great shooters in the business that time. There was Geigel, Ganya, uh, you know, so many of them that, uh, just all over the country in every territory. They were all involved in our business. I mean, uh, our business never differed from what it is now, you know. Uh, it was uh, always manipulated, but uh, there was a lot of tough guys in our business. That's where they all went into. Instead of MMA, they didn't have it. Right. There was no MMA. There was wrestling. Mm -hmm. So you got to remember, all of the goofy, nutty, tough, foolish idiots were in there. Whenever my father was in it, that that then it started evolving from there. Whenever he got into the business, it evolved and evolved and evolved till what it is today. And I'm certainly not knocking it. I think it's wonderful, and I think the guys in it are better athletes than they've ever been, and great performers and ring performers. Can you, know. can you remember like the times? Do you have your? Can you remember some times you'd put your finger out and you'd be like, "Wow, we're this is changing." Maybe, maybe, like, like even, even if I go and I sit back well, in your career, you know, your Japan run, your ECW run, your NWA stuff, it, like it's all changing. And you were so great always, at evolving it, with it. it. It always evolved, but it always evolved to what the people, you know, wrestling has always been what the people want it to be. And that's what it is. It's what turns that turnstile, you know, it's what buys the ticket what makes people buy the ticket. So today, wrestling is what it is, not because it's what Vince wants it to be. He might think it is, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's what the public wants it to be. They are dictating. Mm -hmm. And you're a big believer in that. Yeah. Um, how calculated were you in all the different like reincarnations of Terry Funk there were over the years? Right, because there were so many. Um, I think that I was just a foolish idiot. <laughs> no, not really. As, uh, <laughs> but uh, I had a wonderful life. You know, whenever I was, you know, four or five years old, you know, all of the other kids they wanted to grow up and be Roy Rogers or Gene Autry or, you know, I'm going back to. Cowboys way before you were ever born, mm -hmm. or, or you know, and they all wanted to be, you know, race car drivers or whatever it might be. Well, hell no, I didn't want to be any of that. Mm. I wanted to be a pro wrestler, you know, because my father was. Mm. So all of my life, I have I have lived to do that. But you've also you've changed within. I'm saying you've changed within the times, and like yeah, I've evolved so, so much. always. And how yeah. calculated is it? Just like. Oh, this deathmatch stuff is hot in Japan. I got to change it up. No, it wasn't because the deathmatch stuff. I brought the deathmatch stuff okay. there. I didn't. I came. I made what was hot. Gotcha. That's that's the difference. And then, so how that was that going through your I head? I made that. I I invented the the. Uh, what is it? Uh, all of the damn uh, the flame bar flaming bar. Yeah. Mm. I quit matches and all of that with Ric Flair mm -hmm. and everything else. All of that evolved from my mind mm. and nobody else's. So how did how did that come? Like how does that come to your mind? I guess the question is like how does that come to your mind, or where are you thinking of that, or why? Why, why do you think of that stuff? Because I'm 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 a goofball. Yeah, you know. And I, or what's it inspired? I love by? being I love being a goofball. What's this inspired by? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's just being an idiot or something like it. I think it's probably having mental problems. <laughs> Great. You know, there's a, well, we solved the problem, huh? Yeah, we solved it. Did you guys do? Uh, did you do fire matches in uh, in Amarillo? Uh, no, but you know, one thing about it was my father always claimed to be the king of the death match. He did. Yeah, and he had uh, never lost a death match, and he. Had probably 
a hundred of them, you know. What was his specialty? And then his, uh, he had one against uh, Iron Mike DiBiase, which is Teddy DiBiase, the million dollar man's dad. And uh, falls don't count in a Texas death match. So I forget how many falls that they went, but they went four hours and 12 minutes. And at the end of four hours and 12 Jeez. minutes, they they had a curfew in the town at midnight, so they shut the shut the show down then. So nobody won. Do you remember this match? Yes. You were there. Yes. Were you? You couldn't have been into it for four hours. Oh, absolutely. There were, was. Were like, you a kid or were you old? There was like I don't know. There was like, uh, and I'm serious about this. There was like forty some falls. <laughs> yeah. That's wild. Had to take a thirty second. Uh, deal in between time, you know, and it was four hours and, you know, 30 second rest period between each fall and then a 10 count. And then if you don't get up to your feet, the match is over, you know, mm -hmm. and kept on going and going and going and going. Uh, and then uh, they both went to the hospital in the ambulance. And then uh, they got on Polk Street, which was the main street downtown and got in a fight in the back end of the ambulance, he and Mike DiBiase, and fought their way out on Polk Street and got arrested and taken to jail. And so a pretty good angle. All right. Uh, Tommy Dreamer shared a story about wanting to, sh wanting to use a gun, and apparently your father had already used a gun, and it yeah, almost I killed the town. Him, no. Is that wrong? <laughs> he wanted to know. My father had to use a gun. Tommy got that wrong. He got it wrong. Okay. Tommy got I was trying to think of who was that. Wanted to, I don't know, wanted to shoot somebody through the cheek of the butt or something like that. You know, I think that was it. One of the wrestlers. Yeah, one of them. I don't know what that was. I don't want to go into that. And your dad was like, "No way, no way, no way, no way." He even knew that was a little too much. Yeah, yeah. but he, he did though. He was a strong believer in in uh, great wrestling. Great wrestling. Look at Junior and uh, years that he was champion. You know, as a, a lot of people have really forgotten about him and his the time that he carried that belt and that title. But my God, he did more hours and mm. and you can imagine in the ring. You know, and kept the belt for four or five years. You know, and just steady with it. You know. Um. I go to uh, 300 days a year. Right. In a different town every time. How many hour matches do you think you've done? Hundreds. 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 Like, can you remember, like, you'd be you do more than one a week? Like, seven a week? Oh, uh, for a stretch? Well, well, not seven a week, but I mean, we do because we wrestled in different towns and you had different programs in every town, you know. So it, uh, it didn't fit into everything, but. Uh, uh, did hours after hours after hours of Broadways, you know. And uh, who were you doing them with? Uh, well, I did them uh, with everybody in the country whenever I was champion. Uh, I did uh, name them. Who can I mean? Who name them? Harley. Who rolled with you the best? Name, oh God, there were so many great rollers. Yeah. Wahoo McDaniel's, what a great son of a bitch he was. Could do an hour easy. Doing that, well, all, all of them could do well. Uh, Johnny Valentine, my brother, my father, uh, the Briscoes, uh, you know, just right on, you know, Danny Hodge, you know, and just right on through it, you know. Didn't matter what territory you were in, there was guys that could work, you know. And uh, it was it was a great experience at that time to carry that belt and go into an arena and uh, I'm, what I wanted to do, my main aspirations was to go ahead and go into that that arena that night and make it go ahead and beat because I was champion to beat or go 60 minutes with their top talent and make them better than what they were the night I went into the ring with them. 
and make it better the next week. Not hurt their town, but help their town. And that was, that was what I wanted to do. That's what, uh, that's what a champion should do. There must have been guys. A champion should make the individual that he's with. And so many of them, so many of them did, you know. I was going to say, was there, there was probably a lot that didn't though, huh? Um, Selfishly. Not selfishly or anything else, but, uh, you know, some of them felt a little different. You know, I mean, like, I'm talking back here in my father's days now that the uh, tough guy situation got involved with it. Mm. You know, like Luthez, you know, was, uh, he loved to get in the ring. And uh, if he had a guy that was a bit incapable well, or, or made a bad move whenever he was in the ring with him, he would go ahead and slap the dog piss out of him, you know. And uh, uh, he, was, he was man enough to do it, too. And he was a great wrist locker, you know. And he could, you know, come here as my ass. Right. You know, a come here as my ass. You know what a come here it is, don't you? It's a goddamn wrist lock. It's a wrestling hold. Mm -hmm. Come here. You don't like MMA. Huh? You don't no, like I love MMA. Okay. I just don't like what to, I, I love MMA more than anything else. It's just that I don't like not them or whoever did it calling a chimera, a wrist lock a chimera. I mean, what the hell? They didn't invent the son of a bitch in Japan. Right. We invented the son of a bitch over here. Uh, or hell, I don't know who did. Yeah. You know, it might have been a couple of monkeys. <laughs> I, I, Speaking for us millions of years ago that speaking of japan uh a legend in japan uh masa hori friend of mine yeah. lo loves you always when i go see him in japan I love him where's his t I love where's all your t-shirt yeah. yeah he better <laughs> um and uh haru right the guy who makes your shirts wonderful guy some of the greatest designs by the way did he make the, the funky design haru absolutely yeah um absolutely he's a wonderful person and individual and sharp and he's of all things, is he was just a kid growing up, mm. and he had because he's artistic young ability and could draw, yeah. and that's what he did. He went ahead and he started drawing these, and loved wrestling, so he got involved with it. And he's made a good living at it. Do you remember your first time going to Japan? Absolutely. What was it? Oh, gosh, we uh, we had some serious battles with uh, Anoki and New Japan. And, and uh, what happened is that uh, All Japan, uh, at the time, it was Shoei Baba. And uh, All Japan pulled away from New Japan. And that's the first time anybody ever pulled away since... Uh, I can't think of the guy's name that uh, originated New Japan, but uh, anyhow, uh, they they pulled away from him, and uh, whenever they pulled away from him, it started a war over there, you know, and uh, we were on one side, and they were on the other, and it was... Uh, very serious times over there, you know, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of big time trouble all the way through. Caused a lot of trouble throughout the country, not their country. It just it caused, was complete chaos. The all complete Japan, war. New Japan split. You mean? Yeah. Okay. Complete chaos and, over there. And all Japan split, and they brought you guys yeah. over. Well, who split was Baba mm -hmm. and Inoki. They hated each other, mm -hmm. so they split. And whenever they split, is that uh, put Baba on one side and Inoki on the other side? Anyhow, as Baba pulled away, renamed it to All Japan, and uh, he originally had two people that he was going to use as bookers, not bookers, but as, as his people that had the people in America, mm. the wrestlers, the great American wrestlers at the time. 
and uh, he went ahead and he picked. Uh, he was so he came to the states and was looking for boys and talent through a promoter. And one of the promotions was Fritz von Erich in Dallas, and the other one was us. And he went ahead and picked us. Hmm. So uh, it was uh, a changing time for the entire family, you know. And uh, were you excited about that? Did you think it would change your career, like a, your career forever, or did you oh, think it was just a booking? Oh, I knew it would because they were paying so much money at that time. Yeah, they were paying ten times of what they were in the states. So you must have loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, and and in short periods, and you go over there for like three weeks mm -hmm. and uh, come back, you know, and you can live your own life and live your life at home and and have a family. Yeah. Did you have like a mindset of like okay? Like, hey, we got to do really. Is it you and your brother went over first? My father, well, my you, father and my brother and my, and, you know, and me. And, uh, did you have a mindset of like, we got to kill it out there so we keep on going back? Oh, well, absolutely, of course. Yeah. Of course, you know, and my father was nuts anyhow <laughs> because he went ahead and, uh, he was in World War II and he used to land on the beaches in a, in a landing craft. He was in the Navy, you know, and they'd blow the shit out of him in the water, you know, because they had the artillery and everything, you know, and so he had a natural hatred for him. so he was just absolutely nuts whenever he'd go ahead and go over there, you know, and they, and they knew it. They knew that he was, you know, and they were the same way. They absolutely hated my father. Huh. They, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't like him at all. You know, he had guy genes. Um, did, was there tension with the wrestlers too, American and Japanese wrestlers, or just the people? Well, there was, there was, there wasn't, there was not, it wasn't jealousy, and, and, but it was, it was, a, let's say it was tense, uh, with, with the Japanese wrestlers, uh, the Japanese wrestlers at that time were, it was a pretty, you know, but we were over there for the first times that we went over there. We were over there for uh, New Japan. I mean, Japan Pro Wrestling, mm. which was, that was a whole organization together, you know. And uh, it was pretty rugged then. You yeah. know, they'd try to pretty much uh, kick the shit out of us, and we'd try to kick the shit out of them. You know, I mean, and, and we like, didn't like them, but... It, you go in the ring and work together, but still it was uh, very, very physical, and mm -hmm. it was for a long time over there, you know. And it continues, you know, it continued to be for years and years and years. And, uh, I mean, my God, Stan Hansen's lariat, he, hell, that God dang Hansen would go ahead and take your head off, you know, and Jumbo, and, uh, you know, I mean, he'd use those drop kicks and, knock your head off you know and uh it was it was a great time it was a great time I, you know i mean i i loved it we loved it uh, they had uh, you know and and way up into the 60s and 70s and 80s is they had the war going on over there you know and uh Inoki thought that he would could beat Baba up, and Baba had several guys over there that uh, were pretty tough guys, and it was it went on for years, you know. How about the uh, the singing career? Singing career. Yeah, you you have an album in Japan. Yeah, I know I do. <laughs> and it better not show up here. Really, it's on my yeah. wall. Yeah, bullshit. I, I bought it in no, Japan. You didn't. Yeah, it's so bad. Don't don't tell me that. Sorry, you did not. It's framed on my wall. That's the worst thing. <laughs> ever. But you know they pay me a lot of money. Of for course. That. Yeah. So that was their idea when they came and they said, "Terry, I need a song." Yeah. No, no. They came to me. And they said they wanted they because it. I just got very hot over there. I don't know why, but tremendously hot. You know. I mean it. Uh, and uh, the people loved me and everything else, so they, you know, they thought it'd be good to sing a song, an album, you know. Oh, we make Terry album, 
<laughs> I said, oh, I can't sing. Oh, no, Terry, you be good. You be good. You do good. I said, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, yes, Terry, you do very good. Well, I didn't do good. Who wrote those songs? Do you remember? Did you write them? No, no, no. It was a We Jimmy, Hate School. Who do you think wrote them? Oh, you said Jimmy. Jimmy Hart? Yes. Yeah. What'd you say, Jimmy? I need a favor here. <laughs> yes. They want me to write these songs, well, I Jimmy. I paid Jimmy. I paid Jimmy to write them. Because mm -hmm. they paid me. You right. Know, so I gave him some money for writing them. You delegated it. Yeah, but they were horrible. <laughs> Don't, oh, God. I'm they, sorry to break Jimmy, it up. <laughs> Jimmy, they were good. I'm sorry, Oh, yeah, Jimmy. yeah. Jimmy, that was the greatest song. We Hate School. I was a 35-year-old man singing We Hate School. What sense does that make, you know? Take the dollar. You'll take the yen, right? Yeah. Um, the Forever Speech. Uh, did you have a plan going into that? I never do. Uh, very little do I do with a plan is uh, I like to do things spontaneously in the ring, you know, and uh, I really do, you know, and I think some of the greatest things, I think that's something that, that we have to be very careful of that we're losing is uh, the uh, creativity, the instant creativity of a wrestler. Uh, it's it's uh, something that was in the past that everybody did and everything, you know, and we were, we were definitely all extensions of our own personalities. And that, uh, that is somewhat changed. We are what the writers want us to be. Mm -hmm. But we were all extensions of ourselves. And that's what I think made wrestling really a wonderful thing. Now, some people will go ahead and watch it, and you know, I mean, Again, it's, it's, you know, it's evolved to what it is because it's what the public wants. It what turns the turnstile is what makes wrestling what it is. Uh, so, like, I don't know, it was forever. Just, it, was just, it came to you? It was, a, it was something that... No, it just came to just me. just came to you. you. Know? And that's, uh, that was my life in the ring is uh, creating, you know creating things on the spur of a moment. Mm -hmm. And that's that was wrestling. That was uh, the way it was, which is different. And again, the fans love what they're watching now. And so I am not knocking what the guys are doing now, but it's, it's definitely different from what it was 20 years ago. You, you would say that, wouldn't you? Of course. And I mean, of course you would, you know. Because the pond, why do they do that? Why do they do things differently? Because it quickly and more, you know, they do many, many spots and everything. Why do they do it? Because of the fan's attention span. It's shorter. Mm. But now they have figured out, they have figured out that they can do this and still hold their attention. And I think that's how the fan or the, the American population has evolved. And I think everything in America has evolved that way. Yeah. To a shorter attention span. If you don't do something, you know, is you, you're going to get your ass booed out of there. Right. You know? A YouTube clip's got to be three minutes or else it's it, too long. It's too long. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when I wrestle, so it's getting to the point where, like, I just want to fuck around because that's the most fun to me. And then I have fun in the ring. Yeah. Uh, and I, I feel when, when watching a lot of your stuff, it just seems like you were having the most fun in there. And I don't know how much, how much true that is or how much you saw it as business or I just want to have fun uh, in order, and almost entertain myself and it just, it, to, so uh, it came out. I don't, I don't really, you know, is it, uh, it's my life. It's my life. It's uh, what I've always wanted to do. Uh, Everything that, uh, you know, I mean. But you would agree that you have like an unorthodox selling style and an, an unorthodox, the way you got punched floating uh, around the ring. Well, I don't know. You don't know. I, yeah. I'm going to tell you. you I've, been, I've been punched a lot of times. Right. But I've, I've really floated around then mm. too. You yeah. know? I've been with some guy. Yeah, I've taken too many chair shots too, you know, with a lot of different guys. 
Float it around the ring a little bit. Well, the, a few too. well, then would you say you knew how important it was to be different? Yeah, I know. I, you know, but I knew how important it is to be different. But I, I also know that there's, you've got to hold on to the believability. You've got to. Uh, that has got to be there. Okay. You know, you have to suspend disbelief to really make, you know, and, and, but I don't know about today. That's what I always thought, you know, as you suspend disbelief, you make people believe no matter how you got to do it, you do it, mm. you know, and it, uh, if you got to break a leg, do it or whatever else, you <laughs> know, I mean, you got to do it. You, so to, to suspend their disbelief, you know, so that's how you drew money. You know, is by making people believe. So that's what you tried to do. And I, you know, uh, I'm not trying to be funny out there. You know, I, I want to have a serious match. I don't want people rolling out in the aisles and <laughs> laughing like idiots or anything else, you know. And uh, there's a certain integrity I want to keep within my style, within the fans. I want to keep them honest, too. You know, and I don't want to allow them to get below that level. So this is uh, my show, and yeah. uh, I can talk about whatever I want. And yes. Over the Top is my uh, favorite movie of all time. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, any, any fun stories from Over the Top you could tell me, Terry? Well, did you really shove Sylvester Stallone through that glass door? Well, uh, <laughs> I got into some, you know, over the top was, a, it was a lot of fun making that. It was. And uh, it, uh, it was just a great gig. It was, you know, and, uh, and Sly is, was so wonderful to me the whole time. You know, and uh, it was kind of funny how I went ahead and got into the movie industry anyhow. Sly put me in the industry. Where did you become buddies with him? Well, I went ahead and I saw that he was going to make a movie on wrestling. It just said that, you know, Sylvester Stallone is thinking about making a movie on wrestling. Well, I just went ahead and I just hired a camera a crew and I went ahead and went out to the Double Cross Ranch, not the Double Cross, the Flying Mare, my father's ranch, and he had a caboose down there and I went ahead and got a microphone out there and I went ahead and made, made a promo about Sly, you know, I said, Sly, you overbearing, obnoxious, egg-sucking dog, you idiot, you fool, you know, you're out there and just on and on and on. Did about a five-minute rant, you know, and... Uh, and he loved it. Sent it to him. Just out of just idiocy, you know. <laughs> and he went ahead and did that, and we became good friends. And uh, he used me in about four or five different things. And, uh, you know, but my career went on from then. And this is what's wonderful about it, though. But what people don't know and what you don't know is that I went out there for a different reason than being a movie star or anything else. I went out there because I had no insurance on my family at the time in this business. And I don't know if some of the guys do now or not. But back then, as I could go out there and I discovered that if I could go ahead and uh, get a uh, certain value, $15,000, I think it was, or ten at that time, if you could make that a year, well, you could go ahead and get, you could become a member of SAG. And becoming a member of SAG, you get your insurance automatically. And you get it for a year. So I'd just go out there and make that money, try to make that money, try to get a job, and I'd go ahead and get that job and get that money and get over that level. Then I'd go back to business and go back to working. You know, but finally I re didn't realize this, but what the wonderful thing about it was, was that at the end of 15 years as I get retirement. So that's, that's the best thing. So I am a retired artiste yeah. for a long time. Wrestling now. never gave you a retirement, huh? No. 
Yeah. No. There's no pension coming on that. And no, on that one. No. 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 Does that bite you a little bit, or you understand? I understand that. Mm. Uh, I, it'd be very difficult. Be very difficult. Like who? You know. I mean, here you've got Vince, who you can go ahead and. Are you going to put all of the weight on his shoulders for the entire country of all of the people that are independents that say they're wrestlers? Well, how do you define a wrestler? Does he have a degree in wrestling? Mm -hmm. You know, you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Where you can define other, 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 other professions. You can define them a lot easier than you can wrestling, you know. Well, I wrestled three matches, you know. Well, what the hell? Are they gonna be? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, and then to, to, to finish this off, uh, beyond the mat, yeah. Dennis Stamp. What a great, what a great nut. It's... He is a crazy nut. When you, I mean, you must have like. But he's a good one. Of course, there's those those guys, and you know about those guys. Oh, he's nuts. Were you like, I've got the guy, Barry? I like, <laughs> he's the guy. This is who we need. <laughs> yes, that's, right. that's the way it was. Yeah. And Dennis Stamp, he hated me for that for all that time, you know. Afterwards. Yeah, and I rented him a I rented him a damn Cadillac to take him to the. To the party there that we had at uh, the the movie theater that we they totally paid for, you know, mm -hmm. the company that made the movie and everything, you know, and they played the movie the first time in Amarillo, and they they got you know, and I I went ahead and I helped, uh, you know, I helped uh, Dennis uh, along because I mentioned him to the producer and he. Had him uh, get a limousine and everything else to the damn theater that day, you know. And then Dennis was mad at me. I mean, years yeah. later, he embraces it. He loves it. Oh, he loves it now. Yeah. But he was mad. Did you know that? I... Yeah, he told you. I bet he did. If he was ever around him, he'd tell you. Just ask him the story. You know? <laughs> Dennis is uh, he's a wild man. Mm -hmm. He's not a wild man. He's just a good guy. Okay. Yeah. I love him. Um, and on the show, it speaks the speaks the world of you. And obviously, you know, uh, you have to know that. Yeah. yeah, he always on his show. Yeah, yeah, on this show yeah. he did on this show. Oh, did yeah, I had him on. Him on here I had, of course, night. I had him on. Okay, beyond the mat's very own. Did you? Did was he what, does? And 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 I speak highly of Dennis. Mm. You know, Dennis was a good guy in the ring. He was excellent. He was very good. Uh, was he nuts? Yes. <laughs> Um, uh, when you look back at Beyond the Mat, to you, is that is that just a thing that happened in your career? Or do you like it that it kind of, it's this nice... Well, I, I, I really, really enjoyed making the thing, you know, and it was, uh, Barry was great about it and everything, Barry Blostein, mm -hmm. and uh, the producer, the director, he did everything on it, you know. And uh, I think that he made a very... Good. He gave a very good look at what things are like, you know. Uh, at least I thought he did. You mm -hmm. know? I thought Barry did a great job with the movie. Uh, did you like the movie? I love the movie. I mean, but yeah. for my generation, but Dennis, but you know, <laughs> yeah. Dennis, yeah, Dennis was out there. He, when you saw the trampoline he thing, the trampoline and yeah, getting in shape. Did you was, know that was magic? Barry didn't ask him to do that. <laughs> But I'm saying, that when you going, saw that... Oh, the, the, I didn't know it was going to make a star out of the guy for 20 years, neither did Barry. No, just... Yeah. <laughs> That's what... It hit It hit home on everybody in the country that watched that movie. The trampoline? He said, look at this damn guy on a damn trampoline. Amazing. Who is this amazing idiot? Of course. The best, though, <laughs> He's right? working out with the two barbells. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it's going to hear us, and he's going to get hot at No, he loves us. it. He's, he's getting get booked. Hot. He's he's getting booked. He loves it. Uh, our friends at AIW had you know they brought you in in Cleveland. They brought in Dennis. Yeah. Um, he's you know he's making the rounds again. 
good. Yeah. That's good. He's making the rounds. He's got poems. He yeah. ever write you a poem? The what? He ever write you a poem? He does poems all the time. Well. Some of them pretty damn good, too. Of course. He's got a book. Yeah. He's got have a book. Have you read them all? I, not, a, not them all, but I have read some. Yeah. Uh, so this is it. Uh, Dennis I, always wants me to read his poems, but he doesn't want to read anything that I write. What do you write? Huh? Nothing. I wrote a book. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I, yeah. I'm just teasing. <laughs> I, I thought maybe you had some kind of sonnet that you wrote. No, no, no. A haiku, no. if you will. No. Okay. No, no. Uh, uh, so this is an independent podcast. I am an independent wrestler. Um and uh, you are you are really when I break it down, you're you're the spirit of that independence, Terry. And uh, you know, you know, it is that that people say that I am, and that's one of the most wonderful things that people can say to me. Good, but I'm not sure that I, you know, I, I would love to. I I cannot think of myself as being the guy that did this or the guy that did that man i i don't I, that's not me i i'm out there and trying and uh loving what i do and the same way with you colt is uh you love the business uh a great great deal and i think that the business has a hook and i think it uh, it hooks certain types of people that, uh, and uh, I think you're one of those types, and I think I am too. From two completely different worlds, you and I. But I think that you're. I think that's the great thing, isn't it? Yeah, but but two completely different worlds. But you're hooked on it. Yeah. I am too. Yeah. You know, and that's what's wonderful. Yeah. That's what's great. You know, like I said, whenever my daddy went ahead and. Asked me what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a wrestler. Whenever I was five years old, I didn't want to be a, I didn't want to be a cowboy. I didn't want to be, a, whatever, a race car driver, or anything else. I wanted to be a damn wrestler. One of the greatest yeah. ever, Ter. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> it's true, man. Thank you for being on the show. Well, you are welcome. It's go, go. All right, I checked out Terry Funk's uh, Twitter, and uh, it hasn't been active since 2013. There was a point where he was like on YouTube making weird YouTube videos. Like someone had been like, "Hey Terry, we should get into the new age," and he's like, "All right." And then he started doing something, and then realized like nothing came of it, and he didn't become some sensation or or didn't land on Tosh Point oh or or something that somebody wanted him to get on. So he just went back to being old, cool, sweet Terry Funk which is exactly what he does best. Huge thank you for being on the show. Big thanks to High Spots for kind of hooking that up too. Highspots.com. We'll get into it right now as we hit the plugs and... Upcoming events. All right, the best way to eat is sport, coltmerch.com and digitalcolt.com. Twitter and Instagram at Colt Cabana. Facebook slash AOW Podcast slash Colt Cabana. Past archives of the show are on Howl.fm. Use the code Colt. Get a free month. ColtWrestling at gmail.com is my very public email. Maybe a promoter want to put me on an upcoming show or convention. I got a YouTube channel. You can see some fun there. I'm going to put up some stuff from the fringe. You better believe I am. ColtCabana.com is my website. I got a P.O. box there. Send me something sweet in my snail mail. Upcoming all of August. Please come on out. The Edinburgh Fringe Festival every single night, 10.45 p.m. at the Pleasance Dome. Tickets are pleasance.co.uk. While I'm in Scotland, I'm going to be wrestling August. 6 Livingston reckless intentcom the 13th Edinburgh shop.discoverywrestling.com the 21st Newcastle Facebook slash Absolute Wrestling 26 Kilmarnock BCW wrestling.com the 27th Dundee Facebook slash SWE Online the 28th Glasgow Insane Wrestling.com. And when I come back, Thursday, September 1st, Berwyn, Illinois, AA Wrestling.com. Saturday, September 3rd, Costa Rica, Facebook slash CMLLCR. Friday, September 9th, Cleveland, Ohio, AI Wrestling. And Saturday, September 10th, Rahway, New Jersey, WrestleProOnline.com. That is the show for this week. Big thank you to you at home for listening. You know I truly appreciate it. Thanks to Terry Funk for coming on my little podcast. That's pretty bizarre. Thanks to Cable Guy Jeff and Stu Stone, Kid Russell, Matt Jenkins on the music, Dane Miller with some tech, Declan Creaky Quinn with some tech. He helped out on this one, at D.E. Quinn on Twitter. He can 
also help your audio. He could save your audio. He could teach you how to do audio. Creakystudios.com is his website. Let's thank our sponsor again, HighSpots.com. Hundreds of full-length titles available to download. $5 wrestlings. They got a VOD service. They got a subscription box. They got knee pads. You need a wrestling ring. They'll send you a wrestling ring. So thanks to OneHourTees.com. They help run ProWrestlingTees.com. That's where you can get T-shirts that directly support your favorite independent wrestler. Give those guys some money. Let them live their dream. Tweakedaudio.com slash cult earbuds that I use. Get over 30% off and free shipping just because you listen to this show. A good show. A good show for the week. I'm sweating so much. I'm alive. I made it through. We're getting it done. Come see me at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. There's only so much I could say it. I'm praying people come out and watch the show. We did uh, Manchester and Birmingham, and it was so much fun. It was such great crowds. You guys know who you were. You know how much you laughed. You know how awesome it all was. You, me, everyone. We did it. We did it. We're going to do it in Edinburgh. All right. I'll talk to you guys in uh, in a while. This has been The Art of Wrestling. For Colt Cabana, I'm Colt Cabana. Thanks. Six seconds, five, four, three, two, one, zero, bye, 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 bye.